everybody. <laughs> Are you going to turn the project in early? Is that what we do in this class? We have projects? No. <laughs> Sorry, my bird right here is going to be transparent today. But uh, I don't know. So, yes. How's everyone doing today? We've got the neural nets. I've got the beard. It happened. This is what happens when you don't shave for a month or you shave, I guess, in just your neck and you grow a beard for the heck of it. Can everyone hear and see me? I'm always afraid after we've had these one or two small issues. How's everyone doing? Let's see some people in the chat right here. We've got some people saying hey to each other. All good. Everyone can see me. Thank you, Caleb. I know Caleb's got a beard too. So what's up, Connor? So we've got we've got beard crew in the chat. <laughs> and so um, all this going on, people are checking their points. Say hey to someone in the chat. Like the video. So go ahead. Uh, say hey to your friends in the chat. We're here for positivity. And I'm so glad when people told me that we didn't have some positivity and we fixed that immediately because I want you guys to feel like this is our time to relax. This is our time to learn. And we're just here to have a good time and to, to earn some mu bucks, some stats who are mu bucks. So and I've got, I think I'm a little more boxed in today. Oh, I still reach what? Oh, I still reach all the way over there. I think more boxing over here. So I, I did some reformatting of the green screen as per every day. And I've also got new effects. Let's try this out. Let's see. Let me change this. Okay, this might be a horrible idea. Oh, if I'm doing this, this should work. You ready? Welcome, Welcome to BAS, BAS 474. Did I have an echo right there? Was there an echo or is there not an echo? I can't hear these things through here. I don't know if that sounded crazy or not. Do the rainbow? What rainbow? Are you talking about like just use your imagination? Imagination right there. It's just imagination. We've also got the randomness ready to go right here. Just pure randomness ready to go at any time that I want. Just uh, this is what I do over the weekend. <laughs> is I just reformat my studio every weekend. It's getting me ready for Texas, though, so we can have the uh, fun stuff right there. Okay, the Echo did work. The Echo did work. I've got a new uh, board. I can also mute myself a lot easier. Now we're back. But um, I've got new, new, new equipment, new stuff, and it's working great. And thank you to UT for being so supportive of this. We're actually being featured in the Haslam alumni magazine so they're gonna get a picture today with me with a beard i don't think they're in this video uh they're here for 201 so they're gonna take probably screenshots of 201 while we're teaching 201 and i'm overexposed by all the bright lights see i can't i can't tell you how hot the bright lights are we don't have where's um where's kyle at so every time i point to the bright lights you can be like hey, brian you're always pointing to your lights you got lights there and everywhere okay hot lights there's kyle right there there's kyle with the hot lights <laughs> awesome awesome okay cool so, uh, big news, huge news right here. Uh, <laughs> you guys are cracking me up in the chat. Um, well, yeah, you, you can, yeah, if they're here, um, if they do take screenshots of this class, I'll contact who's ever in the screenshots. So it's okay with like FERPA to make sure if we, they put you in the magazine. Um, they just said 201, so I gave them the link for 201, but they could be here if they saw that there's a stream going on right now. But we have big news right now about the take home. The take home will be released on on Thursday and will be due on Sunday. Did everyone get those dates? Very important dates right here. The take home will be released on Thursday and will be due on Sunday. I hope that that garden's going well. It's not, no, it's not Nick with the garden. It's John with the garden. Where's John at? Good to see you too, Nick and everyone, Joel and Caleb. But take home goes out on Thursday and will be due on Sunday. <laughs> so we have this right here. Does everyone have those dates? Now? I want to see in the chat. Everyone gets a million points if you start putting them in the chat. And start, if you want, like the video, you know, like, comment, subscribe, all the good stuff. So go ahead and put that in the chat that the take home comes out on Thursday and is due on Sunday. I need to see that. I need, I need some people knowing Sunday at 11.59, you are right, Knoxville time too. So it's so good to see everyone just saying, hey, out Thursday and due on Sunday. And I will say this. Well, one, I want to throw a huge... Uh, I want to applaud the BAS Society. They got an award. I think they got, uh, like, I don't want to misstate the award, but I, I just read the email, like, literally moments ago. They got an award for being an amazing organization. I'll just say that. I don't know if it was, like, best organization. It was student groups, I think. They got the student group award for uh, most innovative. Yes, most innovative. There, Joel, million points right there. I just read it, and I was like, that is so awesome because they've literally held so many events and so many different things. They went and saw the server that UT runs all of its stuff from. Uh, they've brought in many speakers. They've done many, 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 many things. They're, they did a, a, a outreach event where they helped with Girls Who Code. Um, great organization right there. And uh, Kara White has been met, very involved with that. And she's the uh, outgoing president of the Business Analytics Society. I, 
I know that um, Raj is going to be involved with the uh, business analytics side. I don't know who the new exec board is totally, and I'm the advisor, so I should know these things. But Raj contacted me to tell him he's going to be, I think, I want to say treasurer. I might be wrong, Raj. I'm very sorry. You told me last night and I forgot. But um, so thank you to everyone who's doing this. And I'll be doing a thing with the Business Analytics Society. So if you want to join the Business Analytics Society, I'll be doing a new thing here coming up very soon because I want to help out their membership. And they have grown their membership by like 24% this year. And I really want to say it. Um, I want to applaud Kara White again. I'll, I already emailed them and said, you know, such an amazing job. But they really have been working. What's up, Calzone? So good to have you here. Calzone's our fan favorite. And we're going to talk about neural nets today, Calzone, if you want to hear about that. So we're going to talk some pretty fun, high-level statistical stuff. So check it out. Um, so uh, amazing job to Kara and everyone right there. Amazing, amazing job. The take-home should open up in the morning, I believe. So stay tuned. Should open up in the morning. So they're going to have a take-home. Comes out Thursday morning and will be due Sunday. Is it like 320 where we submit the answers on a Google form? I think you'll just be submitting the RMD. You'll just be submitting your RMD. You'll be running different models. And I will say this. Um, you will be running... And Calzone, I am so glad to have you here. You are the ultimate fan favorite, Calzone. So um, we've got right here the different models. I just did the lab uh, on yesterday. So the lab yesterday, we went through, and I'm pretty sure it'll be open in the morning. I think I just answered it. Um, the lab yesterday, I went through and made all of these models. And then I thought that the uh, GBM would be the best, but it wasn't. I was shocked. It was so funny. I ended the video and then it ran. And I was like, well, now it ran. So you can see a lot of the code here is basically repeating code. Really, the only thing you have to change about your code is the method you're using. And you have to change your parameter grid. And you will have to know which ones. Brian, a few weeks ago, did you want to talk? Well, he's just a he's just a guy. He's just a guy who's really nice. He's just a he's a he's a great guy. Um, yeah, he is a student in two hundred one. Uh, Julio is in two hundred one. I think I can say that because he's in the chat and he he'll let people know that. But Julio comes in and says hey to our class. Uh, oh, Calzone, that's awesome. You know, we've Calzone, we've heard a lot of great insight. And you could email me Calzone at bsteams@k.edu if you want to say hey via email and tell me about what you're thinking. But at least our students, what we've done with this uh, YouTube way of doing it, are really enjoying it. Um, yeah, he was in the College World Series team. You're right. We can touch on some of the homework tonight. I might be doing... Um, yeah, yeah, let's do that tonight. Let's do that. Um, a great guy who played Major League Baseball. Is, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so um, does everyone understand where we're at? We've got a homework due tonight. Um, we've got the take-home coming out Thursday morning. We'll still get the two homework drops, I believe. I'll make sure everything's very, very clear. I think we're doing two homeworks and two activities. And then here's the biggest thing, though. This is like real talk right here. Please do not cheat on the take home. Please do not do that. That's why we invented Coding Night. I've told this story many times that Coding Night was invented because we had a group of people cheat and it literally stopped some of them from graduating and got them in big trouble with the university because they were posting it online. They were posting it in group me's and stuff. So there was a huge thing. Yeah, let's do that. I'll release that later today. Let me talk to Hylob and Dr. Liu or Dr. Halifu and Dr. Liu. Um, yeah, and so actually a big thing was pointed out to me right here. So here's the thing and thank you so much. I think it was um, Olivia who said this. So thank you, Olivia or Lillian said it or Olivia. And please email me if there's any issues. I just got one person's issue fixed. The eval false was on. So, um, oh, it's so awesome. Yeah, tell me, Calzone, if we can give you advice or I like what we do. And if you like what we do, we want to expand what we do. Like just show people and help people teach better online. So I think it's so easy to like do this conversational stuff right here. So, and I think I told you, Calzone, that I'm from New York. So you, you probably know that. I'm from, I was born in, uh, what is it? Suffering. I was born in Suffering, which is Rockland County. And my mom's from the Bronx and my dad's from Rochester. So, uh, uh, Calzone, you are awesome. Cal Calzone, you are our favorite. You are literally, you are the fan favorite, Calzone. And you are, we are always, what am I doing at? <laughs> okay. So, there was something I was going to say and I'm losing. Oh, yes. Uh, RNG. So, there's the RNG kind right here. This is where we're getting some of the sanity check issues from, and I'm I'm figuring this out as we go. But the RNG kind, you have to change the kind to uh, everyone. Run this if you have R open right now. See what you get. Um, you see, I have rejection on here. 
but then it was giving me the sanity checks. Oh, don't change. If everything's working on your sanity checks, do not change this. Do not change this if your sanity checks are working. My sanity checks have been working. I'm not going to change this. This right here, the rejection or the rounding can control how your, san your sanity checks will work out due to the RNG. Because what does RNG stand for? Random number generation. This is something huge in video game. They talk about the RNG. I don't know what those gamers are talking about, but RNG in video games. And so we have to use RNG right here and it's going to control how we get our random numbers. So look into this if you're getting problems. Also, please tell me if the grading's weird on your assignments. Remember, we are being as nice as possible. And we gotta be like, we're gonna do one last thing here, fun, then we'll start to get serious. Be like, welcome, welcome Cal, 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 Cal Tyrone, Tyrone to, the chat. to the chat. There we go. Um, Jake, I'm running the current version of R and it seems to be giving me the right sanity checks. Let me forget and leave the echo on. So I'm getting the right sanity checks, even though we don't, we tell you not to update R. This is the latest. Um, yeah, and I, I think the latest is 3.6.3. Um, don't change it. If you get your sanity checks, don't change it. Change it if you are not. So yeah, you're doing the rounding. If you're getting the sanity checks, don't change it. Don't change it if you're getting sanity checks. Yeah, that's that's what my um, Mac has is rounding. My Mac has rounding. If you get, if you don't, don't change it if you're getting the sanity checks. So whatever you do, if you have sanity checks, don't change it. Does that make sense? If you're not getting the sanity checks, and I might, sorry, it's taking me a long time to trace these things down because first two years we taught this class and I've been doing it, I think four years now. Um, but the first two years or so, there was no issues with sanity checks. Everything worked perfectly. And then all of a sudden, if you're not getting the sanity checks, go ahead and change it. And so we should be able to go here and go kind equals, I think it's capital rounding. I think it's that. Um, so it's not that I don't, I really don't use this function very much. Uh, is it lowercase rounding? So it says unused argument. So you have to go in, oh, R version. What am I doing? I'm trying to change the R version to that. That's not how R version works. I was like, I thought it was this. And I think it's, there we go. Rounding is not a valid option. Oops, first one. Rounding is not a valid option. So let's go here. Question mark RNG version, RNG kind. So that should bring this up right here. We've got the documentation and RNG kind right here. And we should be able to set the kind right here. Let me look at it this way. So the kind, da, 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 super duper. I love this uh, famous super duper from the 70s. It was da, 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 da. It doesn't pass a certain thing, but super duper just sounds awesome. And so let's go here and type rounding and sample kind so we need to do this right here okay so we need to go back to our code where's that rng well we can write it down here we're gonna write it down here just for the fun of it we're gonna go rng kind and go to sample kind equals rounding and that's how you change it right there warning message that's all right but we could change it back to rejection and there we go right there so um yeah so um, I have rounding and not getting sanity checks. Maybe change it to rejection. I was getting them on this computer right here. So here's your two options right here. And once again, it's I, this is a function I don't use much. So always remember you can change it pretty quickly. Uh, I know I swear they change the randomness with every update of R, and that just we always say don't update throughout the semester. But sorry, it's just been a crazy semester. Woohoo! So um, all that good stuff going on right here. And I think that's got it. That's our what's going on with the sanity checks today update. So we, we know what's going on with the sanity checks. <laughs> okay, I think yeah, the screen's good at level. Okay, so let's do this. Let's hop over to the notes and let's get serious. We've had our 15 minutes of fun. And now we're going to finish up talking about how to make neural networks. I'm gonna go over here a little bit more. Go way over to the side. So when it comes to neural networks, neural networks are kind of, I don't want to say they're the end all be all, but they're all the rage right now. Like neural nets where it's like, oh my gosh, so we got to make a neural net. Neural net's going to solve everything. Yes and no. A neural network is a great way to solve complex problems, especially when it comes to images. Uh, some of my favorite things are talking about the Mario Kart example, which I can't play right now because we're on YouTube and I don't want Seth Bling to copyright ID me. Oh, if he saw it, I wonder what he would think. If he's like, oh, this guy in a class is talking about neural nets. I have to want to play it and let him see it in his copyright ID thing. 
but I'm too afraid. I don't want to get the YouTube channel in trouble. Then I can't live stream on it. That'd be bad. So why does Mario Kart work so well at neural nets? What, do you remember what I said? Neural nets are great, especially with what recognition? Neural nets are really great at recognizing patterns in these sort of things. Like they work for other things, but I would say where neural nets really shine is patterns in what? Images right there, you guys got it. So patterns and images are super amazing to be recognized by neural nets. So neural nets, um, so let me bring it up right here. Let me bring up some uh, neural net, neural net car driving image. It's amazing to see, yes, this is a famous one I've seen. I see one image I already know really well. Um, so cool. Oh man, I haven't seen this one yet. It almost, whoa, what happened? I switched images. Okay, let me go back. Okay, oh, it's like a multi-image. It was like a GIF. Well, we don't want the GIF. So let's go back here. We're gonna grab our screenshot of this. We're gonna bring it over so you guys can see what's going on here with this neural net image. So let's bring up this, let's drop it in. There's the neural net. So this is taking in multiple different things right here to recognize someone in a road. Now, there's problems with neural nets. You guys probably know a lot of the famous cases, like the guy who was in the self-driving car, and unfortunately, uh, someone got hit because they walked out on the road. And the neural nets, they'll learn from the training data. This is, this is totally our class again right now, because the neural net learns from training data, which is the data it was built upon. But how many training data sets have, it's 11 p.m. at night and someone is walking out in the middle of the road and on a highway. So it's not, I mean, a, a human doesn't know how to react to that. But what's the problem is, is neural nets have even less ability to react to new stuff. So you've seen a lot of weird things, a lot of crazy things where I think someone's had their car like drive through the yard and almost hit people. Um, because the car all of a sudden intakes data that it doesn't know how to use and it makes decisions that are completely irrational that no human would make. Um, because all this is doing is just learning from data it has. And when it hits an unknown, it's a major problem. You don't want, you want to train the data on a world of science. Oh, what is this, Andrew? Um, let me see, open a new tab. Okay, let me see this world of science thing right here. I'm not logged in. Oh, it's a neural net? Oh my gosh, it's showing, oh my gosh, this is the, all the information it's taking in. Wow, let's show this right here. Uh, yeah, so let's show this, holy mackerel. That is insanity, Andrew, this is what the, Andrew, I'm just maxing you out on extra credit right now. Uh, let me stop this lest it be a copyright video. <laughs> I'm always afraid on stream. But that was absolutely amazing right there, Andrew. That's even better what this has right here um, because it's taking in all of that information very, very quickly. It's, it's, it's analyzing, it's doing everything it can to actually make decisions. But the problem, once again, with neural nets is with all this image recognition, what happens when it hits an area it doesn't know? And you, those boxes you literally saw in that moment right there was just like this right here where it's taking in everything. It can take from different kinds of uh, information. It can assess a risk level. It can assess distances. Um, it can detect objects. It can detect heat. It can detect all these different things, depth level to see how far things are away. I mean, it's absolutely amazing what the computer is reading in and all it's doing is solving equations. Um, Cap just said, so yeah, I totally agree. And we're going to kind of talk about that right here towards the end. And it's neural nets are literally just like your brain. It's literally like, your brain taking in all this information and then making all these decisions from what's available. And I think that's how we have to view models is that you are literally just gonna have all of your brain power working to make this model. And that's all a neural net is. Like just think of a neural net as you literally, I know you're thinking, well, okay, I take in this source of information, this source of information, this source of information, but a neural net's even crazier than that. Because with a neural net, it's gonna take in all the information and then make an equation, and then make equations from those equations, and that's what we call deep learning. So deep learning is a super complex neural net with many, many layers to it. So we'll talk about these hidden layers here in a moment. Like when someone says deep learning, basically what they're doing, so you guys know my orange analogy, when we squeeze the orange and we get as much information out of it as we can, a deep learning 
is going to like put that orange through a grinder and grind out everything it can from it. So you might think oftentimes deep learning is going to what your models. What might deep learning do to your models? What might deep learning do to your model? What might, because it's going to grind out all the information it can. Overfit, you got it right there, Andrew and Caleb, million points each of you, and Zach and Jake, great job. It's going to overfit. And so think about this, like, it's like if you had a car that you had in a test environment and you had it driving around this test track where like people walked out or these things walked out, if you, if you used a super deep learning neural net, that car would drive perfectly around that. But then when you put it out into like a, a another environment, all of a sudden it starts swerving, it starts having weird issues, it starts bumping into stuff because it's not going to perform at the same level as it did on the training environment. These are key things we need to know that if our model overfits to the training data, which is when it's just driving on that track that we make for it, then we create something that doesn't work as well on new data, which we're not even talking about the holdout because that's when we test our model. We're talking about like new, new data. When we say like, okay, let's put our car to the market. Does everyone see the business application of this? Like overfitting is a major thing. Like if Tesla overfits to their training data, then they'll be like, oh, our cars are totally safe. We've ran them through all of our racetracks. They never bump into anything. We had people like jumping out in front of the cars and they, the car just like skids to a halt. Actually, the car deploys a bed and the person just lands in a bed. It's You wouldn't think it. It's an inflatable bed. The car just does it and everyone's safe. The car's going to actually make people totally safe. But then they put it out in the real world environment and it's just like throwing beds at houses and stuff like this. And you're like, what's going on? This is not running the way we thought because it's totally overfit. So it learns the training data too much. And you have to be very careful. And how will we know the right amount of deep learning to do? Million points, who knows? How will we know, like saying it's safe on the road when you only use the train there? Well, it wouldn't just be an empty racetrack. You could you could do it on a racetrack where you put hazards in front of it, Aaron. Great question, million points, Aaron. You could put hazards on the racetrack, but you use deep learning, which squeezes so much information out of what it's trying to learn that all of a sudden, and that's how we'll know if it actually works. We'll test it on a holdout which what, what Tesla could do is the holdout could be another racetrack with different scenarios, or they could just do real world testing on it too, which is probably the best thing. Probably before they do real world testing, they would put it on a holdout, like that have racetrack A, which it learns from, and then it would only go on racetrack B to see how it does. It wouldn't learn from racetrack B. I mean, you could eventually feed that information back into the neural net, but your goal is that if it goes to racetrack B, where it has different scenarios, different things, like different randomness in it, that it's going to do as well on racetrack B as it does on racetrack A. And you wouldn't want to just put an untested car out on the road. Then after you do racetrack A, which is your training and also validation, you will do racetrack B, which is your holdout because it didn't learn from racetrack B at all. It's brand new information to it. And then the real world is the final kind of test for it. And you would do some preliminary tests. You'd probably put it on like, you know, slow speed roads. You'd work its way up to see if it's doing the right decisions. Um, before you put it on a highway. And I imagine, I imagine hopefully there'd be regulations and stuff like this. Can everyone see the complexity of the business decisions you have to make and like how you can justify to someone, we've put it on these local roads, which it did not learn from. And it was able to navigate these local roads safely. And by saying that, I'm basically saying I trained it on local roads. Then I brought it to new local roads, which it's never seen. And it was able to drive those local roads properly. At that point, I've told you that I've used a holdout sample. I'm kind of transitioning to now we're we're learning from regular roads and we're we're taking in that information. And then we're saying it can work on pretty much any roads because it generalizes that information. Um, these are crazy huge topics. I mean, this is the whole business side of business analytics and neural nets are used in a lot of businesses and a lot of a lot of different things. I, I find it fascinating. Uh, correct this slide. Oh, is it no way, Andrew? Oh my gosh, 10 million points, Andrew. Uh, where is it? Oh, no. Andrew, 10 million words. No, uh, yeah. Can I correct it right now? Edit PDF. Thank you. Is a nice job, Andrew. Rec, cognition. Where is the error? I'm so blind. Imagine recognition. <laughs> Image recognition. Oh, my gosh. Wait, what is going on? It moved. Okay, there we go. Andrew, well earned. 10 million points. Great job reading the slides there, Andrew. You read them more carefully than I did. How do I get out of this right here? Let's see. I'm like an old person. Let's see. No, close that. Eh, there we go. We did it. We figured out how to use Adobe Editor. 
Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. 10 million points. Well earned. Tell me if you've seen anything like that. I always want to know. This is what we call a perceptron. Frank Rosenblatt. I always like saying his name, Frank Rosenblatt. Uh, I just got to say it like that on purpose. And why not? We got the effect. I need to put this in a better spot. Frank Rosenblatt. Frank Rosenblatt. I don't know. <laughs> I'll find better ways to use that. And it's way over to the side because I'm on a very small desk. But you won't forget the name Frank Rosenblatt now. He created this perceptron. And you know what's crazy about this? This right here, I want you to look at this and I want you to say like, oh, these X's right here, they kind of look like something to me. Those X's, they kind of look like something. What's going on here with these X's? This X zero, and it's like we've got the X and it has a, uh, almost like a B. We've got an X two. Oh my gosh, Kyle. 10 million points, Kyle. I like that. Oh, and Jake's already done it. Jake already knows. Jake, you are so right. This right here is basically your regression equation where this right here is going to be the intercept. And then these are the X variables. And these are the coefficients of each of the X's. So you literally have your X1, your beta one, your X2. You've got a multiple regression, million points, all those people right there. So this is just regression. You're like, well, why can't we just do this? Well, we're not going to use one perceptron we're gonna use a bunch of perceptrons together. We call this um, the step, the step, oh, what is it? Uh, ignition function, I can't think of the name of it. We'll see in a second on the slide. But that is the step uh, actuation function, I think it's called, so it's actuation function. So you can use different ones, we'll see them here in a moment, but they're all basically the same, just so you can see, where's the slide with those activation functions. What? Did I dream this up? Did I imagine something that does not exist? Where did I see that? I must have been in my reading of neural nets. But you can use different activation functions. They have different kind of curves to them. This is a step activation function, which goes from a zero to one. So it's either zero or it's one. So it's more like a logistic right here because it's going to be zero or one. So this is a step activation function right here. Probably got deleted. I know, right? <laughs> so this is the step activation function. I'll find that. I thought we were in the complete slides. Oh, we're not. Huh? Let me fix this. Let me go over here. This is the present presented ones. It did get deleted. So let me search two seconds. Thank you. Did I not do the full ones today? Full. Tree full. Okay, two seconds. We're gonna get that full slides. I thought I posted the full slides. That always bums me out when we don't have the full, because we don't have too much to talk about today. But you'll understand all of the theory, very important theory. As you can see right here on the screen right now, you're looking at the equations and how the perceptron works. And I'm logging into UTK. Let me get the full thing right here because I really like how the activation function looks. And there we go. I finally remember what it is. It's the activation function. Not too hard to remember, but it just controls the way the curve looks. So let's go here to the modules. Let's go here and data mining neural nets so there it is and then a long version of slides well that's the presented am i currently in the 2016 well i'll be i don't know what slides i was looking at i think we changed it okay sorry for the delay here everybody i'm gonna go grab because it looks like even last semester we removed some stuff so I'm going to go find the full version right here really quick. It'll just take one moment. And let me go to files because I really like the way this looks. Files, okay. Neural. Support vector machine, neural net. It's only the presented. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Let me, okay, we're going to have to go back in time right here even further. I guess Petrie didn't think that these were as meaningful and he removed them also. I like it. It's it's very interesting to me. Last try. We got one more try on this. So here we go. This is our last shot. If, if this doesn't happen, we we don't get it. We I'll find it later. It's on my other computer. So let's go right here and go neural. And no, it's not here either. Okay, well I'll put it I'll put it up later. It's only the small version here also. And so let's go back. Let me see how the chat's doing. I just went on a tangent. 
and tell me the first how I wrote random seed. So <laughs> I love you guys in the chat. Um, so you guys, yeah, check it out. Probably got deleted. Yeah, I'll find it. I'll put it up here and we can see what's going on. So some very important stuff. Let's hop back into talking about what this perceptron is doing right here. So when we look at this perceptron right here, you can notice we can get just our regular old uh, regression equation. We can also get our logistic equation. Does everyone remember e raised to the regression equation over one plus e raised to the regression equation? We can either do regular old regression or we can do logistic right here. So when we have this, when the perceptron uses the logistic activation function, the n is logistic regression. So it's gonna predict whether something's categorical. I mean, we can do categorical or quantitative and it will predict zero one if it's categorical. So we'll get probabilities right here out of this because we're trying to predict if something is categorical. So we get a probability of it being categorical. Here, we're just doing regular old regression, just regular old regression. So what is going on with all of this? Well, we don't wanna use one perceptron. If you notice, what have we changed right here? We've changed the activation function. So now we have the sigmoidal curve, which is going to do logistic for us. This is the probability from zero to one. So we have logistic regression being reinvented through a sigmoidal curve, but things are about to get really crazy here. You ready for things to get crazy? Here we go, let's make it nuts. Oh my gosh, what have we done? So things have gone totally crazy right here where we have all the different X's coming in and then we have a hidden layer and then we have an output layer and then we have our Y output. So with this right here, what if we were to use this with self-driving cars? What would be like an X1? What would be an X1? What would be an X1? Does anyone have any ideas what an X1 would be if this is a self-driving car? Does anyone have any idea what it could take in as an X1 for a self-driving car? A million points, who knows? What, could what are these X1s? We have to understand what this means right here. And I'll tell you what the hidden layer means. Road length, I like it right there. It's just, it's just a variable it's taking in. Light, the amount of light in the environment. Um, if there is a red light, yes or no. How many trees there are, signs. What are, what are the signs in the area? Like slow down, because it can read the sign. So it can take all this in. It's just speed limit. Boom, I love it. You guys are doing amazing. Million points, all those answers. The amount of lanes, you're right. These are all just different X's, which are different variables. All you're doing is just asking different questions, right? These, because remember your X is explained. They're going to explain what the car is going to do. And then it's going to put some weight to them. So if you see how it uses it, I want to make you make this clear. Each one of these is a perceptron right here. Like if I follow this through, we have a hidden layer. You can avoid the hidden layer. Just pretend that doesn't exist. If you went from here to here to here, from here to here to here, that'd be a perceptron. And we're from here to here to here. That is a singular perceptron. But then we're kind of building this neural net brain from it where all the perceptrons are working together. So you're probably saying to me, Brian, what the heck is this hidden layer? What is going on? Well, the hidden layer, of course, greatly improves it, as the slide says, spelled correctly. So what is the output layer? This is the literal decision the car is going to make. So maybe this is the part of the neural net that controls the speed of the car. So the output layer is the literal Y that might tell the car to speed up or slow down. You might have the uh, angle which it decides to turn the wheel. So the car is going to make a decision on like, so another neural net or another equation is going to control what to turn the wheel. So the output Y depends on what you're trying to predict for the car. Could be things like what speed should it drive? How should it react exactly? In general, how should it react? And I would think that there's different equations for each thing, like how fast should it be driving is marked by a bunch of different, its own neural net. And then what angle should the car turn? Are the hidden layers ensembling? Um, I think of ensembling as model blending. So I would say ensembling is when you use your models to make models from your models. So there is a carrot ensemble. Is that the right one I'm thinking of? And so there's, I think it's the right name of it, carrot ensemble, which can ensemble stuff. I just think for some reason that package doesn't sound right. Um, so the perceptrons can go on forever and the process of the screen can happen for each system the car has to make. Well, the big thing with the perceptron right here, it has a hidden layer in the middle. So I think that's what you might be saying. This hidden layer is a key thing from slide. So how are the hidden layers different from each other? Yes. So this is great, Andrew. You bring up a really great point of this slide. So what the hidden layer is, is it's like we make equations from our equations. And we'll have a slide. Please tell me this slide is here. Please tell me. I'm about to like walk over to my other computer. Good. This slide right here. This slide right here is showing you what's going on with the hidden layer. So you literally have right here, I'll zoom in on it a good bit. You literally have right here that we are going to use 
all of these variables right here, all of these x's, to make an equation to predict the y variable here, which is the prognosis. This bias right here is just the intercept of the equation. But then what do we do from the equations we make? We make an equation from the what? So we use all of these right here to make different equations through different transformations, through different activation functions. So we make different equations right here. And then what do we do to all the equations? We do what to all the equations? We make a what from all the equations. All the equations will work together to make a, because think now, you have basically your intercept right here, kind of a model, yeah, an equation, which is a model. So the whole thing is a model. And so what it is, is you make an equation like from all these, you make all of these into equations. And so then your equations make another equation. And you can see here, we'll show what deep learning looks like. So deep learning is when you add more and more hidden layers. So now you have your X's making equations and then those equate. So there's the equations from the X's and then those equations make equations and then those equations make equations. And then there's an output of four different Y variables. So you can't put multiple Y's on it. I know you can't do this in your mind. You just have to like, I'll be like, okay, so we're going to take our X's in, they'll make equations. And then those equations will work together to make equations. And then we'll make equations from those equations. Then we'll make equations from those equations. Then we'll make equations from those equations, which will then make predictions for us. It's like insanity. I've got so many, you know, what we're going to say, we're going to, we're going to put something in. I'm trying all the new things today for fun. Insanity. So, you know, what? <laughs> it should work now. So, you know what I say to this? It's just insanity. I'm having fun with it. <laughs> the problem is, is I can't hear these things when they happen. So I wish I need to put some headphones on or something to hear what you guys hear in the chat. Okay. We've got an insanity button right now. Okay. We're having fun. <laughs> and so with this in mind right here, this is what neural nets do. Neural nets can do extremely deep learning. This is deep learning right here. This is the insanity of neural nets. This is when neural nets can squeeze every bit of information out of that orange. They can take that orange and oh, just squeeze all the information out of that orange. And we can make it uh, pretty easily inside of uh, Carrot. Carrot has all the options. And it is Carrot Ensemble, I believe. And Jake, that is, that is, I think we'll just lightly touch on that. It won't really be on the test much. Probably next class we'll talk about like the where do we go from here. And I think, Jake, you've been seeing how there's so many high-level things we can do with modeling that you guys are kind of, you basically right now have the, <laughs> I love it. There's so many questions. There's so many things. It's like, who thought of this? How do we do this? What's going on? This is what I want. This is what the end of the class is meant to make you think about is that XG boost. Yeah, it's awesome. And XG boost and neural nets are like the two top things. Like, is you're going to be, well, XG boost, random for us, neural net. That's your, that's your top three probably. So I think there's a quote made, Dr. Petrie had one like XGBoost is probably going to do it if not a neural net. Um, yeah. And so, <laughs> and so here we go. Let's take a look. This could appear on the test. You talk about likely test questions. Everyone perked up. They're like, wait a minute. I'm waiting for Andrew's timestamp right here of likely test question. Um, something like this is a likely test question right here. Let's see what's going on with this. It's a lot to read. It's very hard to read these things. You got to like zoom in and be like, what's going on? And there we go, timestamp. Remember, come back and put it in the video at the end. And thank you for everyone who does that. So I want you to see what's going on here with the top neuron right here. Does everyone see the top neuron right here? So what is, very careful question right here, what is X1 for the top neuron? What is X1 for the top neuron? Let's see, everyone in the chat gets a million points and tells me what X1 for the top neuron is. And probably do them in order. So <laughs> what is X1 for the top neuron? What is X1 for the top neuron? What is X1 for the top neuron? Does anyone know what X1 for the top neuron would be? Bill, you're all right, Jake. You're totally right. It's Bill. And great job, people. Just answer Bill. You get that million points. It is Bill. What is X2 for the top neuron? X2 for the top neuron is a categorical variable, gender male. Now, that's not, there's not gender male and gender female. We did a binary on it. There's gender male and then there's not gender male. So if someone is gender male, they would be one. And if they're not gender male, they would be zero. So we could still, we could use this binary like gender male, not gender male. Um, and then we have smoker. Yes. So if someone is smoker, this gets a one that is the, uh, of B3, not beta three, but B3. Hopefully I've been saying B because B's are the coefficients. Betas are the true coefficients. Party size right here is going to be our B4 right here. So in order to automatically create an indicator variables. Yep. 
Yep, they do it. You're totally right, Jake. A million points. Great answer. Neural nets create the indicator variables for us. They just make them and then they treat them. The quantitative variables like Bill are treated as quantitative. And then we see the indicator variables created from the original variable. So the original variable was gender. And then we have the indicator variable gender male, which has its own coefficient. What is B1 in this model? In the top neuron, let's go to the top neuron again, which is right here. Here's the top neuron. What is B1 in the top neuron? Now you have to look carefully, but you can also look at the equations to cheat. What is B1 for the top uh, neuron? The top neuron, what is its B1? What is the B1 for the top neuron? What's B1? Million points you know in the chat. You're right. Oh, well, careful, Kyle. Careful. That is, uh-oh, I tricked everybody. Yes, Jake got it right. Jake got the million. Everyone else got the million too. But it is 70, negative 74.4. No, no worries. Great. This is why I asked these questions. Um, the intercept is B0. So the intercept is B0. Um, so we have B0. We have B1. We have then X1. This is, uh, this is B2. And this is X2 because it's the second coefficient in the model. So remember, oh my gosh, I should, oh no, we... I hit Command Z or Control Z and I totally did everything wrong. Does that make sense? I think people see what's going on with this right here. Um, does that make sense why these are the coefficients as you see them? The coefficients as you see them. Uh, can you label those? I, I wish I could draw on it. Yeah, let me do this real quick. Um, let me take a screenshot. Let me bring it over to Word and draw on it. Yeah. I wish we could do this in PowerPoint. Um, because then I could do it a lot easier, but screenshot, bring over to where we're going to go landscape in word today. We're going to go landscape mode. I think landscape is under view, talking away from the microphone. Under, where is it under? Where is landscape mode? Layout, there we go, orientation landscape. Cool. It's got a laundry picture. Cool. Okay. So what we have right here is knowing which of these is which is very important so let's go ahead and draw on this make it very clear great suggestion million points right there for ivy asking me to label these thank you ivy b0 b1 x1 b2 x2 b3 x3 b4 x4 you know what we say to that insanity at least the rainbow later so we have this right here. We have um, all of the notation for it. Now make sure you notice that how these go into it, that this right here is beta zero. It's gonna get so congested if I write this. This right here is beta one. This right here is beta two. This right here is beta three. This right here is beta four. X one, X two, I think that, I forget one more, two, Three. There we go. What are the blue lines representing? Those are what are called the offsets. Offsets are the intercepts. So those are the kind of bias. You'll see it in the other side. It's called bias. But those are the beta zeros. Kyle, right there, million points. Great job, Jake and Kyle, asking questions, answering questions. Like it both right there. So it's just the intercept. Uh, we generally just think of them as intercepts. But if you notice, these are each of the intercepts or offsets. And then if you notice, we get a final equation from this. So the final equation is going to be from all of, and so we got to make this clear right here. The final equation you should be able to write out right here. Try writing in the chat right now. I'm going to max out the first person who writes it in the chat on extra credit. Who can write me the final equation? You got to beat me to it. I'm going to start highlighting it. Who can write out the equation for me of the final? It's on the slide too if you copy it right there. So we go right here. We see that this is, and we take these right here. And we're just trying to predict tip percentage. So this is top neuron, middle neuron, and bottom neuron. And we've got here, this is going to be B1. Uh, yes, correct. B2 and B3. And this is B0 because that's the offset. So you should be able to write it out with this information right here because I've given you all the Xs. So I've just written all the Xs. And so we've got, yes, I think, I think Caleb's got it right here. Uh, Caleb, you might have, wait, check your, I think you just did a, you did a typo on the top one. I think you said, I'm going to give it to Caleb still, but I think Caleb, you just typoed the top neurons, uh, coefficient. So the top neurons coefficient should be 1.2 if you round it. 
uh, 1.24 if you see the top neurons coefficient, or maybe it was hard to read on the on the YouTube video and everything. But great job, Caleb. Everything else looks accurate. So if you could just correct that, and so people watching the video or anything see that uh, you have it right there. Awesome job. And so does everyone see how we're doing this right here? We just have the betas times the x's. Kyle, I'm also maxing you out too. You guys got it. I'm going to be as nice as I can with the extra credit. Just realize that. Keep participating. Keep interacting. And yes. So this is a very likely test question. I do like test questions like this. Like write the top equation right there. Nice job. Awesome work. And so let's go back, 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 back to the slides. Here we go. And there's the equation. Does it not have the equation on here? There's the final prediction. Yeah, so, oh, was it on the slides? Please tell me there's not a typo on the slides. <laughs> so B1, B0 is from the blue lines. That is correct. B0 is the intercept or offset or bias. There's a lot of names for these things, but it's just the regression equation thing right here. This is B0 right here. So written this way, this would be B0. Um, click away from that. Uh, B0 is once again there. So there's the B0 in the equation. That's the blue line. So once again, this is the blue line right here. So this little thing right here, this right here is the blue line. That's the blue line number you just saw. And we can see it right here. The blue line number you saw is this right here. There is, if you notice, X0 is equal to 1. So you're just timesing it by 1. I don't even... I couldn't, I wouldn't have told you that if you told me, I'd be like, it's just B0. But this is the weight of the offset or the weight of the bias. So there's a lot of names for it. Uh, Mr. Rose something um, came up with this right here. And it's literally just your regression equation. So when you think about it, that blue line right there is just the intercept, the offset. And you can see how it works right here, where this number of 0 0.08 or 0, negative 0 0.008 is going to be right here as the intercept right there. And all we're doing is making an equation from our equations. Does that make sense to everybody? We're making an equation from our equations. It's absolute insanity. It's amazingness. Um, I bet you could, Jake, uh, email me. And I mean, put Dr. Petrie on the email too. I'd love to know about that if, it's, if you can visualize this pretty well. Uh, what does the error mean? I what do you mean by the are you talking about the offset the bias on the last slide oh on the last slide you're talking about the last slide like what we're looking at 70.96 i am confused kyle uh you'll have to tell me which slide you probably can't see the slide numbers because they're behind me uh, look at the neural net, the neural net right here. Okay. We got the neural net. You talking about this neural net, this slide right here. Okay. On the, what does the error mean? My brain is totally. Oh, oh, right here. The steps. Oh my gosh. That's a good question. Um, so we're doing tip percentage. And the at least the way it's pointing at Kyle, 10 million points pointing out something I didn't even notice. Um, I hate to say I am uncertain. I don't want to make up something, but I hate to say Brian's pleading uncertainty right here. Um, I'll ask Dr. Petrie. Um, I use neural nets. I think they're awesome. Um, I do not know what it's reporting. I do not know what that means. And that's an issue. I know how they work. I know how the equations work, but I don't know what that terminology means for it. Great question right there, Kyle. Probably steps probably is like how many times it tried different transformations and activation functions. Like steps probably means how many different trials it went through of creating these equations and trying to fit the model to it, to the validation and everything to create it. Um, the error, I do not know what the error means. Great question, Kyle. Stump, this is Stump Brian Day. So you, you've achieved that goal. Could it be the miss of the numbers that make up the output layer? Um, I highly doubt that this is an error like for, I think it's I think it's some, it's a diagnostic thing for the creation of the model. It's next to steps, which tells me like probably how many times the model tried equations, which is what the neural net does. But I don't think it's related to the error of the model because we're predicting tip percentage. So I don't think tip percentage would have an error of 70.965. You know what it might be? It might be the total error. That could be the, the sum of the errors on the data. 
because tip percentage is a rather small number and this is the tip percentage data set so that might be the error on all the predictions but i would prefer it'd be like a, a typical miss so i don't know um that can't be a typical miss or anything like that. it's way too large i'll look into that and i'm very interested in what that means too so here we go with bmi making all these predictions right here if you think about this you could literally have someone come in and answer a questionnaire and then come up with a pretty good prediction for their bmi or other things like that or their prognosis you're welcome welcome kyle great question so once again you think about one area i really think where i wonder if they're using neural nets and someone could do some looking into this but things like radiographs if you were to have a neural net analyze a radiograph for you and tell you uh just an estimate of what the problem is then you could um you could probably get a pretty quick diagnosis on something if you think about it, if you've worked in the medical industry it takes a while to take a radiograph and then have someone analyze the radiograph you have to take it you have to have it analyzed you might get a second opinion so what if we have a neural net that can kind of give you a second opinion now hopefully the doctors wouldn't just throw it to the neural net and be like well i don't know how to read radiographs anymore the radi the neural net will just do it for me we still want humans in this because the neural net might make a really wacky decision, especially if it's something it's never seen. Imagine, so I always think about animals because I think about Chelsea, you guys know that. So imagine if you have a dog that swallows a, what's it gonna, what's something it swallows? I don't know, I'm thinking dogs will eat anything. <laughs> so, you know, if the dog eats a foreign object that the radiograph, like no one's ever seen, the, the neural net's ever been trained on this. The neural net might be like the dog has some sort of issue it doesn't have it might say oh the dog has um i'm trying to think of something i feel like chelsea's gonna watch so she's like you can't diagnose that with a radiograph a lemon <laughs> there we go the dog swallows a lemon it swallows the lemon whole like for some reason which would be amazing and so all of a sudden it's like it diagnoses it as like a tumor or something which probably i don't know that might happen too but a human might be able to like, no, that's in the stomach or the small intestine. You know, it's an obstruction. You know, that's not a tumor. I mean, it could be, I don't know. And so the radiograph, it could make a decision that is so absurd that would basically lose all faith in the neural net. Does that make sense? That's, that's our problem with statistics and things we have to explain to people is that a human might look at that radiograph and be like, it's obviously this. How did your computer program that we spent hundred thousand dollars on that you developed for a year make this ludicrous decision and what would you say to them you would say well the neural net was never trained on anything like this it's never seen this even though this is obvious to a human the neural net just doesn't know how to handle something it's never seen before it's never encountered anything like this so you have to be really smart in training these things and there's always going to be new scenarios that's why humans are still better at things than neural nets you just you know, you can't beat a human who's trained on these things. I mean, maybe one day we can, but does everyone understand that's a huge problem with neural nets? The dog swallows, I don't know, a lemon. I'm sure the dog has swallowed a lemon before. So yeah, it's, I want to develop these things. I want to work on this. Like, I don't know. Dr. Pichy said there was one package that would let you visualize the hidden layers, but it was pretty clunky and he didn't remember the details. That is awesome. Oh, Dr. Pichy is amazing. So here we are right here with some numbers. Dealing with these numbers might be very hard for a human, but once again, a neural net will break these down into parts. Here's a number broken down into parts. Here's how the neural net's looking at the information. It could go pixel by pixel on this. Does anyone know what number this is? Broken down into parts. You've kind of got a straight edge here. You've got a looping around here. Million points, who knows what number this is? The computer knows what numbers it is. Ah, oh, it looks like a six. Hi, V, you still get the million. It's a zero. So it is a zero. If you kind of put together all these images, you'll notice that it has, I know this little part up here is trying to trick you, that little edge right up there, that's trying to trick you right there. Oh, look at all those, wow, I love how all the different answers, million point all those answers. But the computer is going to be able to figure out these numbers and figure out the commonalities between them and the common features. That maybe zeros have these sort of edges around them, one is like continual pattern. So the computer is going to be able to recognize this and this is how we probably see a lot of really good uh, text to writing. Like if you're writing to text, all that good stuff right there is just going on pattern recognition. So building up a really good neural net that's trained on a bunch of people's different writings. 
And so hopefully everyone writes a certain way, but you don't get that. So we see all the really great stuff with neural nets right here. And what am I showing you on the slide right now? Everyone should know this instantaneously, and this should be a huge mark in the lecture right here. What do we have in the slide right here? What do we have? Any ideas what we have going on right here? Any ideas? What are these things right here? You should know what these are. We've got the number of hidden layers you can use, the number of neurons in each hidden layer, and the weighted decay. And I swear this is being covered up again. I do not know why that's happening. I am totally confused. So sorry about that. These are parameters. These are tuning parameters. You're totally right. We should know these instantaneously that we are now looking at tuning parameters. Nice job, Andrew, in the comments. These are tuning parameters right here, which will control for us how we uh, choose our model, like what models we're making. Tuning parameters have how many different models we create. So you saw yesterday when I was doing the XG Boost, if you watched to the end of the video, I created a very large tuning grid for my XG Boost. So here is the tuning parameters, tuning parameters for my XG Boost right here, or my GBM, not XG Boost, sorry about that. For my GBM, this took probably 15 minutes to run, 10, 15 minutes. That slide right there is number, we're gonna block it out again. Slide number 67 right there in the notes. Slide 67 has the tuning parameters. And so you can think about this. We have the weighted decay, which is going to be for regularization, which controls the bias variance trade-off. So the weighted decay, which is going to like not look at the slides, is going to be how much we kind of degrade the coefficients. Would you think about them? If they decay more, we're going to take less information from them. So we want to see how much information we're taking. So we want to guard against overfitting. So right here, once again, the weighted decay is going to control how much the coefficients decay between each step the model goes through. So it might be each of the steps or pretty much each of the layers. But what we're looking at right here is literally the bias variance trade-off. Anytime you see regularization, bias variance trade-off should be in your head like this. And everyone, I, I swear this causes so much repeat at the end, but we have to ingrain it in your head that your model has to work on new data. And how do you know it works on new data? You don't have a super low bias model. I mean, that's one good indication. You don't want the you don't want the naive model. I mean, that'll work about the same on new data, we would think. But you want a model that has a good bias variance trade-off. How in the world do we find the model that has the good bias variance trade-off? How do we find it? Huge test question right here. And I am writing test questions as we speak. How do we find the model with the good bias variance trade-off? How do we find the model with the good bias variance trade-off? How do we find it? Cross-validation, Will, awesome, million points right there, Will, you're totally right. Cross-validation is how we find the model. How do we, which is validation portion, so cross, exactly K-fold cross-validation, bootstrapping, anything we want to validate the model. There's other ways than K-fold. We use K-fold, we can reuse repeated K-fold. So what do we then do to show that our model works on new data? So we, we use cross-validation to find our model. How do we then know for a million points it works on new data? How do we then know it works on new data? How in the world do we know it works on new data? This is something you should know like that. You should be like, how do I know it works on new data? How do you know your model works on new data? Test down the holdout, boom. Those are, and those are things we should know instantaneously. You guys got it. Practice right there, a million points, everyone. Good to see you, Yulia. So good to see you, Saeed. And so I think I saw Saeed earlier too. So we test down the holdout, great answers. We have to know these things in, in predictive model building. You have to make a training, then you have to validate your model via the fit control. So you can go back to the code right here. We always have to reference our code. You'll see right here, I've got a fit control somewhere in here. Here we go. So here's my fit control. This is controlling the K-fold cross-validation. And you can use repeated. So we rarely use this. So, so let's go here and use this. So, uh, oh, I don't have it turned on. It's probably a bad idea. <laughs> I've got so much stuff before this. We're just going to run all of it. So I restarted R, so of course it's not restarting. There's making my support vector linear model and all this good stuff. Yeah, I can see everybody in here. Knowing doing stop the model, because I think I've ran all my, there we go. Cool, it's in carrot, I should just ran carrot. Um, oh no, I broke it. So there's repeated, here we go, good, it's working now. Uh, let me bring it over to here so you guys can see what's going on a little bit. Uh, if you go down to the method right here, you can do repeated CV, and now we need to do repeats. So you can do repeated CV. So let's go right here and let's change the fit control to repeated CV. Sure, why not? Repeated CV. And then let's go here. We'll make this look nicer. We're doing class probs equals true. What will be, because I'm doing class probs equals true, what is the metric we're, we're gauging the model by? You should know this pretty quickly. With class probs equals true, 
what metric are we gauging our model by with class props equals true we're using this i didn't put in the second one because you could say well what if this is here what are we gauging our models by with class props equals true million points who knows accuracy nice job jake right there you're totally right that's being gauged by accuracy so we should be able to run this i think i've got the wine data set loaded in error in class props equals true oh did i not I put in, i knew it i was thinking it when i wrote it i was like put that comma right there and then i didn't put the comma because i put another argument and so i didn't put my comma so here we go right here let's create this model and now we've got some repeated k-fold cross validation so I'm wondering how the plot will look because I don't I don't use this one as often. I mean, if you like k-fold cross validation, why not do repeated k-fold cross validation? I think we mentioned that in the slides at one time. It's briefly mentioned. All repeated k-fold cross validation does is do your k-fold cross validation, and then repeat it. And I did ten repeats. What is wrong with me? I did k-fold cross validation four repeated ten times. So it's going to put it into four different slices of data where we have our validation. And then we have our training data, then we have our validation, then we have our training data, then we have our validation and then our training data, and our validation and our training data, and it'll do that 10 times. So it's repeating the k-fold cross-validation process 10 times to see what is the best model. So it's going to ensure, and I really want to take a look at the output and see what it gives me. I think yesterday on the wine data set, we were getting an R-squared close to our best R-squares were like 90%, and the random forest produced that. So I will say this. Um, this is a huge thing. I don't want to put this on the test, but your top models are probably going to be in this order. And Jake, it should, you should email Dr. Petrie and say, what are your three top models? I'm going to go XG Boost. Then I'm going to go Random Forest, and then I'm going to go Neural Net. Let's see. We're going to take a bet on this. Tell, say to Dr. Petrie, what are your three top models? You'll be like, why did we learn Support Vector Machine? Why did we learn Vanilla Regression? Well, why do you need Vanilla Regression? It's basically the simplest thing out there. It's top three models. There you go. <laughs> yes. Um, vanilla regression would be used if someone wanted a really simple model and probably wanted descriptive statistics, especially I'd be a little afraid to use it for predict. I mean, you can do vanilla regression and do validation on it. But vanilla regression is basically the bread and butter of simple statistics. It's super important. My brother is about to relearn uh, linear regression. He's in a professional MBA program. And everyone should know simple linear regression. It's just the equation of a line. All you do is you make a line. Then you got logistic when you're predicting a categorical. Then you've got support vector machine which can also use um, a linear model or a linear kernel, polynomial kernel, radial Gaussian. Then you've got your neural nets. I will say this. One of the questions I'm thinking of more questions to write for the test. This is test advice stuff right here. Is think about this. Let's see some answers in the chat. And I swear I'm going to put this on the test. So if you're watching this video for another class, please realize this. Um, a support vector machine can be used to predict categorical or quantitative data, true or false. Support vector machine can be used to do categorical or quanti quantitative, true or false. Support vector machine can be used for categorical, quantitative, true or false. For both of them. Is that true or false? Good time, Sam Saeed. Support vector machine can be used for both of them. That is true. Good. No, million points, Leah, right there. That is true. Support factor machine can be used for both categorical quantitative. Linear regression can be used for categorical and quantitative. Linear regression can be used for categorical quantitative. Linear regression can be used for categorical or quantitative. True or false? Linear regression can be used for categorical quantitative. Linear regression can be used for categorical or quantitative. True or false? I saw the same results as yesterday. Linear regression can be used for categorical or quantitative. Did everyone see how long that repeated k-fold cross took? It took forever. That's why maybe you don't use it. <laughs> maybe you can if you want. Just let the computer run overnight. Linear cannot be used for categorical or quantitative. That is false. How about logistic? Logistic can be used for categorical or quantitative. Can logistic be used for categorical or quantitative? Nice job, million points, Jay, Caleb, and Saeed, and Leah, and Christian. Linear can, I mean, logistic can only be used for what? Logistic is only used for what? Logistic is only used for this. Logistic regression is only used for this. Categorical. Partition models can be used for quantitative or categorical, true or false. Partition models, so let's see, true or false in the chat. Partition models can be used for categorical, quantitative. Partition models can be used for categorical, quantitative. Partition models can be. True or false, you know. 
That is very, very true. You're right. Um, because we can predict, remember how it works. It uses the majority level for a categorical. It uses the mean of the leaf for a quantitative. So you have to know how these models work. I keep reinforcing that, like what you can use them for. Um, I think we said support vector machine can be used for both. Can neural nets be used for both? Yep, neural nets can be used for both. We see that in the slides. So just in case, and I think we pretty much, we've, I'll finish up the ends right here. Um, neural nets can be used for both. It's made clear right here that neural nets can be used for both because here's quantitative, here's categorical. So neural nets can use for both uh, quantitative and categorical. So it should be very clear a neural net can be used to predict both. Uh, linear only works with quantitative. Linear only works with quantitative. When someone makes a linear model, it's because the Y is quantitative. So the only ones that can't do both are linear, logistic. I'm trying, if anyone thinks of anything else, I'll probably max you out on extra credit. Linear is only for quantitative, logistics only for categorical. And there are ways that someone can say a partition model, like a regression, uh, a regression tree. Is that what they call it? I rarely call it that, but some people, some people call it that. And if it's a regression tree, they're probably talking quantitative. But still, it's just a partition model, and then it's like a specific partition model. Like, we can use regression on categorical quantitative, but linear regression is going to be quantitative, where logistic regression is categorical. What someone says, can we do regression on a categorical va variable? The answer is yes, because they're just talking about the umbrella of regression. Does that make sense? Like, you've got regression for categorical quantitative, but then you've got logistic for categorical, and quantitative is uh, just linear linear regressions most people when they say regression they're probably talking linear but specifically logistic regression is categorical linear regression is quantitative does that make sense on clarifying those to everybody does that understand which one is quantitative which one's categorical so it's important to know when to use a certain model like it's it's very important like can i use this model for this like i'm predicting whether someone will pass or fail the class i could use logistic regression i could use a partition model i could use support vector machine i could use a neural net i could use boosted models um, because these all handle categorical variables. So I've got lots of options. The only thing I really can't use as a linear model to predict it. I can't linearly predict. If you think about it, it's because of the way it works. A linear model is going to go outside of the zero one boundary. So logistic, when it predicts that someone is passing or failing a class, we will get a zero one prediction on it. Take a look at the last little bits of notes. Really good stuff right there. Knowing what models to use and when, I can't reinforce that enough. So last but not least, we have the tuning parameters, which we were talking about just briefly here. Number of hidden layers just literally controls this right here. This would have hidden layers set to one. This would have hidden layers set to three right there. So that's just the number of hidden layers. Wrong click. And go away. It's going to slide. Good. And then we have the number of neurons in each hidden layer. So the numbers of neurons in each hidden layer is controlling this right here. Of course, if we increase the hidden layers, if we increase the neurons, it's going to be more likely to overfit. We'll, we'll see which one works best on the validation. But even then, you can have models that sometimes think they work better than they do, which we've seen. But look at the standard deviation to tell you the uncertainty. Can't state that enough. Um, we've got right here trace equals false. Once again, I always say to keep trace equal to false unless you want to flood your screen with a bunch of output. We'd probably see all the steps happening. You know, maybe we'll do that here in a second. Line out, set this to true if you're doing regression. So there's very important right there. False if you're doing classification. So you'll notice, once again, neural nets can do categorical or quantitative. We've got the preproc right here to, uh, to preprocess the data and all this good stuff. So we see right here, let's hop over and we just got these two last slide, pros and cons. But let's hop back to this right here. We'll click on the all button and let's go down to the neural net that I already have in here. Okay, so let's clean this up. Um, I do always like to clean up my code. It makes it easier to see. So this is a huge bit of advice for everybody. Um, you can clean up your fit control right here. You can see that we're predicting a categorical variable. So we should have everything good to go. Let's see, we've got the line out equals false. Trace equals false is also not gonna show output. Trace is an output function that just controls seeing what's going on. We'll turn it to true here maybe in a second. We haven't put it to true yet. We've got the size right there and we've got the sequence, all this good stuff. So let's go right here. Top three from Dr. Petrie, random force because they are easy. Regularized regression because a lot of problems still have linear enough relationship for it to work. Ooh. I think, what did I say? I said, I said GBMs, he's got to go neural nets at the end or he's got to go GBM. If, it's, if his third is not GBM and neural net, I'll be shocked. I know we're, oh, Calzone, so good to have you. Calzone, you'll tell us what you thought of all this. Boosted trees. There we go. We got some boosted right there for any serious problems. But so, what? ask him why he doesn't like neural nets. Be like, what's your problem? I know there's only like 200 characters. So be like, 
where what's what's the issue with it what is your issue with neural nets <laughs> say brian we should get dr petrie here in the chat that'd be cool send him a link to the video we only got a few more minutes but uh send him a link while i clean this up right here and make it look all all purdy we're in the south here so say we're gonna make it look all purdy right here so i know it'd be so much fun dr petrie is a wealth of knowledge he's taught me so much and it's it's fun listening to him because you know um Dr. Petrie and I, well, more, I don't know. I don't want to say I'm young. <laughs> I've got a beard now, so I'm not young. But um, a lot of this stuff has been developed over the years that we've been doing this. So neural nets, like the perceptron was like 1956 by uh, Frank Rosenblatt. Um, tell him that Brian, <laughs> I think Dr. Petrie has a problem with my choices is the way it should be phrased. So um, like I was saying, regression is good for a lot of stuff. Regression, you know. Uh, <laughs> Petrie, Petrie's awesome. He just watch Petrie code and your mind will explode. He just like, uh, here's Dr. Petrie coding. He just like, you see, <laughs> I'm too, I don't know what to write. Like he just, he'll just type everything so quickly. Be like, how do you, I mean, I hope that I'm getting there. He's, he, he impresses me still to this day. EX43 wine data set not found. So let's pull up the data. There we go. Oh, the other wine data set. And so let's go right here. Uh, <laughs> so we got the neural net running away right here. The neural net's doing its thing. So we should be able to look at, if we plot the neural net, we should be able to look at the tuning grid for the neural net. And are we, we're predicting quality again. Um, he doesn't really do much research. He helps with the um, he helps with the Milton scholars. So he does research with the Milton scholars. And I will say this, please apply to be a Milton scholar. I mean, uh, we've already closed applications for this year. And you know, Dr. Petrie was right. Um, the neural net did not win predicting quality. The one that won predicting quality, you see him the link? That's so awesome. We'll see if Dr. Petrie appears in the last few moments right here. Um, I don't know if I, I don't still have this up from yesterday and it might be too much to run right here. Let's turn, um, line out equal. We don't want to change that. We're going to go trace equals true. So trace should control our output right here. And there you go. This is what you'll get if trace is equal to true. Fun stuff. Just tons of output that we're all going to read. And stopped after 100 iterations. That looks to be the steps right there. So craziness. This looks to be the error right here that it's coming up with. So that's what's going on if you turn trace equal to, to true. And verbose is just going to get us even more output. I'm 99% certain that it's going to be even crazier amounts of output than we just saw. Where's my output? Verbose is equal to true. Give me that crazy output. Once again, you just don't often want these things on. It's more like a debug mode. So, um. Oh, Maybe it'll give it to me when I look at the output from the results here. Same there. And let's just look at the results of the neural net. There we go. And once again, we should all know why are we fitting on accuracy right here? We're fitting on accuracy because we chose the certain fit control that we're using. So the fit control we have all the way back up here. We got to put it back nice and neat again. And I will finish off by saying this. Let me do the uh, support vector machine I did yesterday. So we still have our support vector machine coded in from yesterday there is my gbm and the one that won out or was the random forest that won out so we need to look at our random forest i want to point this out that you should take your results this is a big last thing right here and i hope dr peach has seen this hello dr peach you're in the chat whenever you get your results right here from your model i have been so <laughs> we cast a spell dr peachy has a has appeared dr peachy one thing i've been trying to reinforce at the end of the semester right here is that we really should take all of our results from our models and we should maybe store them. Now, one issue I'm going to, I guess we could make it into a list right here. So we can make each of these into a list. So let's put them in a list. Uh, I'll see your suggestion on it. The random forest yesterday was the best at predicting quality. So I think there's my GBM and here's my random forest. Um, oh, let's go back. Yeah, we'll ask that in a second here. We'll ask that. We're going to run this. Then we're going to ask Dr. Petrie's thoughts on that. Let me change my fit control because I was talking about the repeated K-fold. So this will take way too long if I don't have this right here. So let's change the fit control back and let's bring up our parameter grid and then we'll take a look at this right here. I know, so here was our best model, Dr. Petrie. Where's my random forest model? I can't find it, too much code. Now there's so much presser. So this was, we're currently at an accuracy of like 85. Uh, we, Dr. Petrie, this is Calzone Tyrone, our fan favorite right here. We've got our random forest. It didn't beat out the GBM. So you know what, I think Dr. Petrie said uh, random forest was his number ones. 
And <laughs> you're awesome, Dr. Petri. I love it. Dr. Petri said random forest word is number one. And Dr. Petri voted random forest. And look at that. Random forest right there, just to review. And I'll, I'll hop out of the way of the screen. But we've got right here, um, I'm on the wrong screen. I need to go over here. I've got two screens. Here is the fit for the, well, hold up right here. Here is how we fit for the neural net. The neural net could barely pass 85% accuracy on predicting the quality of wine. <laughs> you guys are so awesome. And then here is the, uh, just with three different uh, amounts of variables selected for the M try, uh, just these three different levels. And we see, and once again, you can't pick 3.5 because it can't put 3.5 variables through each tree. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna store this as row two, I could store it as value two. And what do you think, Dr. Peter, we did a comparison where we go list and in our list, we put, I call it row. It's not really a row. And we do row one and row two. And we can then compare these two models right here. And it's very easy to tell at this point. Now, this is, I'm going to ask the class. You guys got to impress me. We're at the end of the stream. They were asked Dr. Peach the big question. Here's the question to the class. Why is the accuracy for the random forest way better than the accuracy for the neural net? Why is the accuracy for the random forest way better than the accuracy for the neural net? Anyone have any ideas? I will max you out on extra credit. We're in the last few days of the class. This is something you should be easily able to identify that the random forest is way better than the accuracy for the neural net. And so Calzone, you probably learned this in your intro to stats class. It goes back to a very kind of con very similar concept. I'm going to start solving it right here. I'm going to solve this equation, which could very well be on your test. So here is the equation I'm solving, and Brian's just finding a certain what. Then we're going to start to picture our last question. Oh, no, we might have lost everybody. You're maxed out on extra credit if you know Brian is simply solving an equation to get a what right now, which I was able to look at it and tell. Let me give like 10 more seconds, and we're going to start to picture the last question. Because we have Caleb, you're right. And I think, yes, Caleb, you're right. This is a Z-score. And that Z-score is ridiculous. Will, you're also right. Bill and Caleb, you're maxed out. You guys are both right. This is a Z-score. That Z-score is ridiculous. It's a very, very large Z-score. Joel, you're maxed out. One more person, Elliot. Uh, so now remember, Elliot, we're doing a categorical variable, so we're going to look at the accuracy. I'm still maxing you out, Elliot. You got it. Okay, let's ask Dr. Peter our big question that Brian did not know the answer to. Dun, dun, dun. Dr. Petrie, on this slide right here with all the coefficients and all the neurons, and we got the hidden layer and all that good stuff, what do these two values right here represent? I said, I pleaded ignorance. You can rewatch the tape. And I said, the steps is probably how many iterations it was going through, creating the neural net. And the error might be the sum, because we're predicting tip percentage right here. We're predicting the tip percentage. So the error might be the sum of the error on tip percentage, but I'm, I don't know. And it might be uh, this final model it picked right here with all these equations when it predicts the Y, the error might be. It, it's not a typical error, it's not an RMSE, but we're predicting tip percentage, which is quantitative, so that might be the sum of the tip percentage errors it makes. And then the steps might be the number of iterations it went through to, to create these equations. We'll see what Dr. Petrie has to say. Steps is the number of iterations it took uh, to converge to the coefficients before each convergence, yes. I bet error is the sum of the squared, so it's the sum of the squared, so it's the SSE. So the error is the SSE. So yeah, I was thinking, I didn't know if it was in squared units or because it doesn't say S. I wish it just said SSE. So it looks like, yeah. And that's how we'd usually report error is the SSE. Um, so yeah, timestamp, Dr. Petrie solves all the world's problems right there. All of them have been solved. If you looked right here, here's the number of iterations. We did see this because we turned on the trace equals true and until it reaches convergence. So what it's doing, and just a quick note right here, reaching convergence is something we talked about earlier. Um, we were talking about the K nearest neighbors reaches convergence. You also heard about convergence with K nearest neighbors, where it keeps moving the centers um, of the cluster centers to figure out where they should be. And it's going to keep moving them, keep moving them, keep moving them. And that's where we have max iterations. So you see here, we stopped after 100 iterations. So apparently, this neural net has a max iteration in it, looks to be set to 100. We might be able to change that as a tuning parameter. And so it reached, uh, if it didn't reach convergence, because if you notice, it's changing the coefficient. Ooh, those coefficients are changing. And they're changing very slightly. So maybe it decided to stop. But you would hope that the coefficient after so many iterations would not be massively changing. So there's the weights right there. And then we, that'll be controlled by weight decay, like how much these coefficients, uh, we lose them. I think that's got it. Dr. Petrie, so good to have you. 
We've got a lot of fun. Today has been complete and utter insanity. It should be saying it. And we're gonna end today with last but not least, we got our rainbow it's for imagination and a little bit of randomness. I haven't worked on the dark retreat. And last but not least, so email me if you got questions. What do the students think of the beard? Okay, one in the chat if Brian should shave the beard and two if he should not. One is shave the beard immediately and two is not. We're all big fans. <laughs> so so uh, we're getting some twos. The beard is great. We're getting some twos. We're getting some twos. Oh no. Oh, Calzone, you're my favorite. Calzone is fan favorite. Calzone wins the day. <laughs> Calzone's votes count a million times more than everyone else's. Uh, the beer is a winner. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're going to end with our fun outro. So check it out. This is for the stat tool wanters to remind them to turn their project in early. And also, you may know this, this, this is the voice of Nick Brown. So this is the voice of Nicholas Brown uh, doing Rick uh, Shan Sanchez. Um, so here we go. Ending class. And I'll be on the other stream in just a moment. Turn the project in early.